truly a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Nicholas, for inviting me, and also thank you to the Cyprus shipping community for having us over here. So today I will be presenting on the uh, three major shipping markets, which is uh, dry bulk, food tankers, and container shipping. And following that, we'll have a panel discussion on these three sectors. So just a bit of background on Drury. Drury is a London headquartered shipping research firm founded about 50 years ago. Besides research, we also do maritime consulting, supply chain advisory, and maritime uh, equity and fixed income research. So to start with, uh, this graph over here illustrates our view on where in the cycle each of the major shipping sectors lies. As you can see from this, um, our view is that the LPG and the dry bulk sector are probably furthest ahead in the cycle. Crude tankers and product tankers, on the other hand, are furthest behind. I'll go into this in a bit of detail uh, for the main sectors. So starting out with the dry bulk sector. 2016 was, as we know, a very poor period for the dry bulk sector. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a time when we saw record lows in the Baltic Dry Index. However, it was also a year where there was a recovery in the sector. And 2017, we saw strong growth, particularly coming out of China. Uh, although we saw a bit of moderation of that growth as we approached winter season as China cut steel production in 28 cities, comprising about 30% of their total production for the period from November 2017 to March 2018. This is the fleet growth outlook for the dry box sector. As you can see, relatively healthy. Last year, we saw 3.7% fleet growth. This year, we expect about 1% fleet growth. Next year, about 1.2%. On the whole, the order book is about 9.9%, which is up from about 7.5%, which is what it was in about July of last year. But still, it's not really worrying low. These are still, from a historical perspective, this order book is still quite low. So iron ore, coal, mining bulk, and grain are the four main uh, demand drivers for dry bulk shipping. If you look at the trends over the last few years, we see that iron ore's share of dry bulk shipping demand has increased from about 45% to 48% so in this period. Coal, on the other hand, has slipped a similar percentage of 28 to 24. Grain and minor bulk have been relatively steady. Our expectation, however, is that going forward, iron ore demand, which is really driven by China, is probably going to moderate as the pace of infrastructure growth in China starts to slow. Last year there was growth of about 6%, this year we expect about 3 to 4% growth, and over the next few years we expect that growth rate to actually flatten out. Again, if you remember the main components of steel used in China are infrastructure, property, let's say shipbuilding, car market, etc. The property market is already slowing a bit. Infrastructure, we expect, will begin to slow. So there will be slower growth. We still expect positive growth, but slower growth. Grain trade enjoyed very rapid growth over the last two years, almost double digit uh, growth. We expect that growth to moderate uh, this year because of slower growth in major producing countries such as Australia. Demand continues to be strong, so if the harvest is strong in key producing areas, we would expect that growth to come back, but our current expectation is that it will be 1% trade growth for grains. Minor bulk, we expect to ex we see ex uh, strong growth uh, this year as well as next, and by minor bulk I mean commodities such as soya bean and bauxite and nickel. And also we are seeing strong ton-mile demand growth in these minor bulk commodities, so US China, Brazil China, Guinea China. These are sort of new routes that are developing and adding to ton-mile demand for these commodities. I'd just like to put the spotlight on one particular minor bulk trade. This is spodumene. This graph over here illustrates the exports of spodumene out of Australia, which grew six-fold last year. Spodumene is used to produce lithium batteries. China 
plans to produce 2 million cars, electrical vehicles, by 2020. And as part of that plan, they're building huge new capacity for building lithium batteries. And so they're picking up this commodity in a big way. So 90% of this spot gaming exports are going to China. Now, in terms of total volume, it's a relatively small amount. It's only about 3 million tons. But it's interesting. It's, it tells a story about what the future is going to look like. The coal trade we expect will moderate as Asian countries are moderating their use of imported coal, they're using more domestic coal. Of course, there's also the shift from using coal to clean energy, renewables, etc. This year, we expect the industry profitability to improve. So we we look at a bit down margin, we expect for the industry to be about 35%, last year about 30%. Uh, and in particular, we expect the smaller size vessels to uh, benefit more because of higher utilization. <coughs> Moving on to the container shipping sector. The container, container shipping has gone through a very rough period, as we know, over the last decade. The good news is that the order book to fleet ratio today is at a historical low. Uh, we expect this year, however, to be not a fantastic year because supply growth this year is expected to marginally exceed demand growth. The, um, a, lot of those, yeah, a lot of those ships which are getting delivered, which are on the order book, are large ships, so about 80% of the new buildings on order in terms of capacity are for ships over 10,000 TU. However, when you look at it in terms of number, the sub-5,000 TU capacity ships are, are the biggest number. The third quarter of 2017 was the most profitable quarter in, in the last seven years. Uh, all major carriers, barring HMM, posted a profit. And of course, as, as happens oftentimes, the profits were plowed back into ordering new ships. And so we saw this huge spike in orders. And the profits were really for the liner companies, they were not for the independent owners. So the liner companies placed the orders and they tended to be there for the larger vessel segments. The independent owners really haven't placed many orders over the last few years, and that trend has really continued. Last year was incredible in terms of port throughput growth. We had 6% growth. Uh, this year we expect growth of about 4, 4.5% at best. Uh, so strong growth, relatively speaking. Uh, however, that doesn't necessarily translate into better rates. And we saw evidence of that last year when we saw, if you look at the spot rate index, we saw higher ship utilization levels on some of the key routes, such as the east-west head haul route. However, we saw spot rates actually decline. And, and that's because carriers were choosing to focus on building market share uh, rather than build profitability. And unfortunately, that's a facet of the industry. So in the immediate aftermath of Hanjin, there were about 1.4 million TU of ships that were idling. That number dipped down to 500,000 TU at the end of last year. So this obviously indicates very strong demand coming back. Uh, we counted about 54 ships that were reactivated between September and December 2017. Having said that, a lot of those ships were fixed on relatively short-term charters, perhaps indicating that Liner companies were still not confident about the long-term prospects of growth, and it could well be that we'll find many of these ships back into the idle fleets um, when they come off charter. So as I said, the, the liner industry, the biggest problem with the liner industry is uh, price wars, and there's always that risk. So even if we have high utilization, strong growth, it doesn't necessarily translate into high profitability. We have seen evidence of that in the past, and we expect it will uh, continue. Uh, our view is that the more consolidation perhaps is required in the industry. Already a lot of consolidation has taken place. Our expectation is that more will take place, certainly. But more is required. Moving on 
to crude tankers. So crude tankers on the demand side, we expect this year about 1.3 million barrels per day increased oil consumption globally, so fairly strong consumption growth. A lot of that consumption growth is, is driven by the Far East, the Far East in China particularly, they're building a lot of new refineries and that will add to ton mile demand. The US is becoming a potential exporter, so that could be an interesting player in the future. It already is a little bit. Uh, there's also what's hurt the market uh, over the last year or so is decreased stocking activity by countries like China because of the higher oil price. So if we have a, a lower oil price again, that's obviously that's good for time for oil demand. That could be increased stocking activity again. That could be also potential on tango again. But we're still currently in a high oil price environment, so we don't see that. The crude tanker market did quite well in sort of latter half, of, really the last half of 2014 and 2015, following which there were a number of new orders placed. A lot of those ships got delivered last year, they're getting delivered this year. And of course, they're entering a market where demand is lower, so they're driving down rates, which is why we have rates where they are. Uh, unfortunately, our expectation is that rates will probably continue until we see a, a sort of structural shift in demand factors, uh, because there's, there's, there's an acute oversupply at this pre present time. Fleet expansion last year was 4.8%, so quite strong. This year is a little bit less strong. However, it's still going to be a, a fair amount. Uh, there's about 242 vessels on the order book, which in itself is not a huge number, but then there's also the issue of the supply overhang. It's all the ships that have been delivered last year and this year need to be absorbed before we can, before the market can begin to absorb all these new ships that are coming on. Of course, the rise in demolition could accelerate the recovery. Um, we're seeing some signs of that. Last year, there was about 9 million dead weight of ships that were demolished. With rates what they are, we expect that more owners will choose to demolish vessels rather than continue to trade them. Uh, so we're expecting 9 million dead weight again this year and, and 2019, although I think we could well be wrong. It could be greater than that. Thank you very much. So we'll start with the panel. Yes, well, thanks for the presentation. Well, if it's okay, I'll leave it to you to conduct the, um, the actual panel and get a quote for the questions and, um, and get the synergy for the um, friends on our left who are along the last scar tissue and expertise in the business. Um, just to kick off on one particular question I'd like to ask, um, you've placed a lot of emphasis on the pattern of trade. Um, the worrying factor which we find, I think, in the shipping industry is a correlation between the increase in the market and the order book. You mentioned at one stage about the place of the orders, and there was a, a, fairly, like, a fairly substantial rise of the order book when, once the market started triggering off uh, the 2017. Um, what I'd like to do is, if you can obviously conduct the moderation phase the way you want to, but one question I'd like to ask, if you can place some basis on what we're going to do with the, the, the potential of doing a, a bust and break situation or having more order books than what we really, really would want. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess we'll discuss that over the, the course of the panel. So, yeah. Sorry. Okay. You can answer this uh, one by one, uh, starting perhaps from Reiner. Uh, so in terms of vessel investments, uh, what factors do you consider when making vessel investments? And also, can you share with the audience uh, what was your best investment? And also, what investment didn't play out as you anticipated? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to Nikos as well for, for bringing us here. Thanks to Gautam. Um, and uh, good morning, everyone. The question uh, with regards to uh, vessel investments and how we evaluate uh, 
in assets and how we look at investing in ships is apart from the, uh, the, the basic financial evaluation or financial analysis, which would definitely include looking at the, the value of the ship or price of the ship as it stands today and compare it with what is a new building price of a similar vessel. Not always can you find a comparable ship uh, years years in the, in the future, but and then depreciate it depreciating back to what we're looking at today. And then comparing those two, that would be a pretty decent metric of whether this is, there's actually some value in, in the ship itself. Um, then depending on uh, whether you put leverage on or what in, in your targets, of course you're looking at the yield, the cash on cash yield for, for, the, for the ship and what you're looking at for in behalf of your investors or your funds or, or your owner, however you're, however you're set up. Um, on the operational considerations, of course, we're looking at the ship from a commercial commerciality uh, basis. So, is, is she tradable? Is she tradable now? Is she tradable in the future? Coming 2020, what is the bunker consumption? Is she a high consumer, deep drop type of vessel? Can she go into various ports? And all these considerations that come with uh, buying a vessel. Um, obsolescence is something that will probably become more and more relevant with 2020, with investments that regulatory requirements uh, demand uh, and that's something that has to be spent that we spend a lot more time on than before uh, and of course the condition inspecting the ship seems to be pretty basic but you see people buying ships left right and center without actually inspecting them and once you take a deeper look or a closer look there's quite a lot of hidden issues so we tend to inspect every single ship that we that we see um, I hope that answers your thank you Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, based on the EU, uh, EU study of coastal trade and size of the cargoes, our group concentrated on 4,000 death rate general cargo vessels during the 80s and 90s. Our today's best investment, apart from a few bulk areas, handy sized Panama and Capes, where we're very successful in special locations, ex shipyards, and second hands, with our own tabioca cargoes in place, but not using our own ships. In the late 90s, we entered the container feeder segment, a segment quite cloudy and still uh, cloudy today, unfortunately. So was that your worst investment? The, the, what, what was your worst investment, would you say? Or was that any? No, the worst one I could not say, but okay. the investment right. in the feeder is still a little bit cloudy. Okay, thank you. John. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Erasmus Shipping Master Group is uh, focused on the dry bulk sector, especially relatively large carriers of Panamax to Cape size uh, bulkers. Um, coming to uh, the criteria for our investment, uh, basically we, we never, in the last few years, we never buy a ship because she looks cheap. Uh, we always have a very much employment and cash flow driven project. So uh, what's, what we have done uh, in the last few years always, we have uh, a fixed employment, a fixed risk backup to ensure uh, sufficient cash flow on a debt service. So based on this model, we, we have been, let's say, trying and going through uh, the difficult uh, tire dry bar market in a few years and keep marginal profitable in the last few years as well. Um, to the specific project, I would say uh, last year we also got, got two older Panama Spokers sold out after serving five years debt, uh, debt free and coming off a long term charter to commodity majors. So uh, uh, luckily we got a market and turnaround, we got also doubled equity investment. Uh, to the disappointing part, let's say, uh, probably it's not yet real di disappointing, but uh, we also invested some uh, quality Chinese built Cape size Spokers last year and we fixed also equivalent um, uh, time charter period to commodity major as well. Uh, I would feel that actually from economics return wise, it looks still very, very decent uh, because of the earnings, no difference from Korean or Chinese, oh sorry, or, or, or Japanese build cape size, not much difference. However, the value uh, looks still very much low, uh, low valued. So that's, I would say that uh, it's still out of a little bit uh, expectation that uh, the value gap between especially top class Chinese built Cape size with a Korean built such a huge gap. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. 
Uh, my next question again to all the panelists. So in the next few years, of course, we're going to be faced with the low sulfur regulations, which is a big issue for all ship owners. Uh, what, is, what are your strategies for addressing this? And uh, are you going to be looking at uh, scrubbers? Are going to be having low sulfur fuel, LNG, LPG? Starting with Reiner. Yeah, this is a hot topic and uh, something that's at the top of everyone's head who is in, involved in this business. and. Uh, at this moment in time, there's I see very little clarity in what's actually going to be the requirements. And you know, one question is also: Are we going to see the actual implementation date being first uh, of January 2020? Um, if we assume that is going to be the case, um, some ships simply cannot fit scrubbers because of the design. It's difficult to to fit. It's an enormous capital investment. Uh, age is a consideration when you're looking at uh, deploying this on on the ships. Um, so it's a bit of a wait and see attitude at the moment or, or stance, but we are definitely looking at, at the various opportunities and options, and we're looking at the fleet as, as a whole, and always trying to be fully in tune with what's happening out there, both regulatory as well as technically, uh, whether we should install this or not. Um, and typically say, I guess, for a large, large crew tank, it would probably make sense uh, to look at scrubbers as a technology. Um, for smaller ships, chemical tankers, it might not even be practical, and then you start, it makes sense to run on, on MGO or alternative fuels. Uh, in, as a principal view, I, I don't believe that 50,000 refineries should be floating out on the ocean, it's rather that the refineries ashore, uh, that's where they should be producing these low sulfur, low sulfur products, and that's what I think would hopefully uh, happen. And the, the adoption of scrubbers have not gone as, as fast as perhaps the IMO have thought, and uh, we'll see what happens now in 2018 and 19 in the ramp-up to the, the ultimate thing. This is most probably the hottest topic of today. We consider ourselves to be in the same boat as some other owners. We do not want to have refineries on our ships. Maersk is, the, is only one example in the distinguished league. Scrubbers are expensive, Scrubbers are sophisticated pieces, a lot of work to install, and they use a lot of energy themselves. I'm always ready for a ban on non-compliant fuels. Is this considered to be a, great, a threat against owners? We have built, all ships and all other owners in this forum, have built ships in accordance with valid rules and regulations and for a lifetime of 20 years. Where's the toolbox to comply with new emissions <coughs> regulations? We expect the fuel industry to supply the, the fuel worldwide. So I will try to answer as well. Um, I would li like to echo uh, the panel uh, about wait and see attitude in general. Uh, I think uh, for, for the owner side, uh, we are relatively in a passive situation to such regulation given year on year uh, on such a challenging market. Uh, on the scrapper issue, uh, I think uh, as I also fully agree with Captain Cork that uh, I think probably fundamentally the initiatives should come more from the oil and refinery industry. Probably in a two years time we may see a smarter solution on supplying the fuel uh, for the engines. And uh, I heard a, a final interesting uh, comments from some charters that I visited last month that they may say that uh, in a couple of years time we may we see worldwide supply of uh, the low sulfur uh, fuel oil probably the scrapper uh, whichever is on board vessel could be even a burden for the owner so it's, it could be a very tricky situation at the moment and meanwhile I heard also uh, certain Japanese yards have already started receiving orders on uh, fully marine gas oil engine bulk carriers already and basically delivery 2020 onwards. So that will be also a very interesting trend to observe. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. My next question again is for all the panelists. Um, could you comment on your uh, view on how the bank finance market is, is going to evolve? We know the last few years have been very difficult period for ship finance banks. It's become very difficult for owners to, to get funding. How do you see the market today and how do you see it going forward? Well, it's a fair bit of uh, cleanup, so to speak, to, to be done still with uh, large banks with huge portfolios of non-performing loans 
and prior to this, and the banks are now, uh, or should be at least, focusing on, on clearing out these from their books, and there's very little time or, or people left to focus on the front line, on the front end of the business, actually pro providing financing for, for prospective or an existing ship owners. So, of course, I still believe, and I think we know that first-class ship owners still have access to capital. I don't think that's an issue. Um, but the banks are being surpassed to some extent by, uh, to a large extent, by Chinese leasing. And that's just obviously, it comes with its own challenges, and, and the, that market is also changing. I also think like capital providers such as ourselves um, will become more and more relevant. Uh, obviously, the cost of financing is different than you would typically have, have, have seen from, from banks in the past during the heydays, but you know, that turned out to be a difficult proposition, and now we are in this market where we are. And uh, I think that, that the provision of the financing will be something that will change quite dramatically. And uh, we will not see the banks stepping up to the front line uh, as in as large a uh, larger way as it was in the past. And our alternative capital pro providers and sources will be will become quite more important than before. If you would have asked me this question first half of 2017, I would have answered either in the U.S. or in China only. But today, we see banks who have exited the shipping portfolio to come back. And they are now considering to enter again based on the improved shipping markets. Margins are certainly healthier than in the 2008, uh, 2008. Leverage is more reasonable compared to pre-2008. New regulations, new basal regulations are only coming 2020. So we have another two years to go. In 2017, the financing went down to 29 billion only. This was uh, the 11 years low. But the shipping market is improving, as I said before, and even small banks in small countries are offering now ship financing again. Um, in general, I think uh, the trend would be, uh, the ship finance trend would be at the moment uh, moving from uh, west to east in general. Uh, in our own company's case, last year we also uh, said goodbye to two European banks that we have already been with more than six, seven years already after a clean record we left behind. Uh, we refinanced the fleet with uh, Japanese and Chinese leasing banks eventually. Uh, I think that's maybe temporarily due to uh, very difficult regulations putting ahead of the uh, European banks in general. They are very much uh, experienced and knowledgeable in ship finance, obviously. Unfortunately, the regulations at the moment is really give a big pain for them. It's about just to uh, not interrupt, just to uh, mention uh, for the first of all, I'd like to mention to the audience and to invite, or to at least invite to, to say that she's here, the new um, shipping under secretary, Ms. Natasha Bilidis. And I'd like to welcome you as you just came in to say that to uh, congratulate you on your appointment. And I hope you share the enthusiasm and the stamina which you will see during the course of the day. Anyway, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you. Now, on that note also, um, just to cause a bit of background, uh, uh, write a bit of um, uh, debate, I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Hanjana to mention uh, what you view about the three issues which you just heard earlier. Maybe your comments. <laughs> that was a very silly point. But what, what if I could make one uh, particular comment is that um, uh, I personally, I mean, you probably know anyway, I've got a bit of scar tissue. You know, I've been around for half a century and we've seen these ups and downs. And um, what I've heard earlier, especially by, uh, by your presentation earlier, I try to keep, keep to one basic axiom in shipping. <laughs> buy the rumor and sell the fact. Because basically, if you stick to that ruling, you can't really get it wrong. Now, I'm smiling at you again because you got it right. Because basically, <laughs> eh, most of the times. And uh, that's the issue which I think is, um, I think when asked to bring up as a relevant point during this discussion, that unfortunately, you know, banks come and go, charters come and get heated up, uh, regulators become overregulated. But the point of the matter is that uh, shipping, I think one should emphasize this, is always a matter of timing. 
it's timely. You know, if you, I mean, there's been so many situations in the shipping industry where people get things right for the wrong reasons. And sometimes we get it wrong for, for, for different reasons. So that kind of inconsistency sometimes puts us in a position whereby even though we, we saw your graphs and your, and your, your trend which you exist in the market, the market unfortunately doesn't comply with logic. And um, the only satisfying fact in that particular regard is the fact that the shipping players, the shipping players as such, are in general inconsistent and emotional people. That's our saving factor, because we can adapt to what we think we should be on a Monday and change your view on a Friday. And uh, this sounds inconsistent. In fact, uh, I have to have uh, five children, and I've also often been accused of sometimes, you know, that you never do anything which is particularly organized. And I learned something from my old father, God rest his soul, that we run a business with organized chaos. I repeat, organized chaos. Not very impressive, not very impressive. I mean, you don't get brownie points to mention that in the public audience. But unfortunately, this is the way the shipping runs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sure the questions we'll get into the sectors of so John. Perhaps I can start with you. I think the most the sector, as you saw, that we are most optimistic on is, is the dry bulk sector. The order book, as I said, is uh, relatively low. It's just 9.9 percent, 1 percent free growth uh, in this year, 1.2 percent uh, next year. Are you expecting a much bigger order book uh, this year? Are you expecting a lot of orders to be placed in 2018? Thank you. Try to buy the rumor now. And so uh, I think I agree uh, that the, uh, the official statistics on order books sounds very low. Uh, however, I would also feel that uh, uh, there are still so many orders not emerged out of water yet, although been done uh, last uh, couple of years quarterly in, uh, off market. Uh, today we can say that the major yards in the Far East have been full for this year and uh, probably most of them full for 2019 for the major yards in China and Japan mainly. And uh, uh, I think uh, last month in January we heard also new orders also added on top about another 4 million dead weight uh, in January alone. Uh, of, of course we have seen uh, such orders uh, particularly focused and concentrated on large oil carrier sector and uh, Kamsa Max as well, not much beer vessels. Uh, so this is the general statistics. I would say that uh, uh, it should be considerably uh, optimistic in general compared to the years in the past. Uh, well, on the other hand, I think that positive things would be still the demand side, as you mentioned in your presentation as well. The growth is there on the demand. Uh, Chinese economy at the moment is still very much solid on demanding, especially iron ore. Last several years, time we have seen always the records being kept uh, on an annual basis on the growth of more than one, uh, in, the, in the figure is one, more than one billion tons of iron ore imported into China. And uh, I think this trend should uh, be kept uh, as long as, especially the Chinese currency, re remain appreciated against the dollar. And then we've seen recently the trend even go to uh, one dollar equals 6.2, 6.3 levels. It's very hard for the export-oriented Chinese economy. However, for the purchase power, I think that uh, for the purchase power for raw materials will be remain firm. Thank okay, so your, your expectation is that coal and iron ore demand of China will continue to be firm over the next few years? Yeah, I think that's the, uh, the general view. Uh, to the smaller sector, I mean, uh, the green part, which our company is more focused on, the agriculture products, I think that's even more uh, optimistic from the past uh, data. We have seen in the last 15 years uh, Chinese imports into, uh, I mean, for the agri green cargoes uh, on the 15 years accumulated ratio is about 800% actually. So that's amazing uh, achievement also. So the demand for green cargoes, uh, green cargoes into China should remain even firmer, although it's represented relatively smaller percentage comparing the major commodity of iron ore and coal. Right. Thank you, John. So that's short-term view, let's say. Right. Ryan, I know you have some exposure in the drive-out sector as well, so what is your output from the market? 
think we tend to uh, tend to agree with uh, a lot of what John said. You know, echo that echo that view. I think uh, coal is eventually a declining story, but it's still part part and parcel of the Chinese energy mix. Iron ore, we also believe in a strong, uh, strong, strong story there. And that's for the bigger ships. On the smaller ships, the grain uh, is, is something that we've seen grow exponentially over the last couple of years. Uh, specifically, uh, we see soybean exports. We see now wheat coming in and going very strongly into Asia, where Indonesia is almost overtaking some of the bigger, previous bigger uh, wheat importers. And we also see China, obviously, with a, with a strong uh, demand. So we think, think that the uh, demand side is a very interesting story going forward. The scary part is always, of course, new building, new ordering, but uh, it looks like some yards do not necessarily have um, the price margins there to, to absorb and take on large orders. So um, hopefully the supply side will be kept in, in some relative check. But the demand side and the story there looks, looks very promising on the dry box side. Okay, so a question uh, for Captain Koch. Um, on, the, on the container sector, we have seen, of course, as you know, a number of uh, very large vessels which are on the order book. What impact do you see this having on, on the sector that you operate in, in the feeder sector? Um, as, much, uh, as, as many more uh, mega ships are coming, we are, we are getting more optimistic. In January 2018, uh, this was a record month of con container deliveries. 24 mega ships of 200. 28,000 to you were delivered. This was, but this was not sufficient to satisfy the, the demand. The idle tonnage went down to 82 vessels, or only 300,000 to you, or only 1.6 percent. So the demand is much higher than the new building will will cover from the from the supply side. All segments were almost sold out. So we are extremely optimistic for the. Uh, years to come. The month of February is very crucial for the container market. If you see one week before the Chinese New Year, the activity in chartering is as high as 2018, we have good reasons to believe, to be optimistic. And with the 3.9% growth, the IMF growth forecast of 3.9% worldwide growth GDP, we have reasons to believe that we are on the right track. Okay, so thank you. So I, then I, are you suggesting that these are going to be better times for independent owners as well? Are you expecting chart rates to go up? And yes, I expect this to be better times for owners. The container lines do not want to be involved in feeder shipping. This is not their business. They would love to give this away to, to uh, other shippers. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, moving on to the tanker sector. I suppose, Ryan, you're the only person who operates in that particular sector. Of course, you saw our outlook pretty negative. Do you have a different view? Do you expect market to recover more quickly? Uh, I don't really have a different view. Uh, I think the OPEC cuts is obviously uh, causing havoc in the markets. PLCC, Suez Maxis, and the large crew tankers are making bar are barely making operating costs depending on the age and the economic and the economic uh, consumptions or eco eco type of ship or not um, and this is this is something that we're going to have to suffer through 2018 i think and perhaps into parts of 2019. Um, an outlier here perhaps is uh, there's another opec discussion at the second half at the turn off of the first half of the year where russia has has indicated they wanted to, to discuss the issue again uh, and we'll see whether production comes back and that will definitely be, uh, be a major change for the market um, but there's a definite overhang of ships uh, and that will not go away uh, that quickly there's significant deliveries coming in this year although it's uh, it's come down uh, obviously from, from the peaks uh, but i think this, the crude markets particularly are, are going to struggle for for, for this year Okay, thank you, Ryan. And as we've seen also in the last few months, particularly we've seen the U.S. shale production pick up significantly. Of course, we've seen export volumes increase over the last one year. What do you foresee 2018 and 19 times? We just saw this, the U.S. becoming uh, 10 million barrels a day producer uh, on par with Russia and uh, Saudi, although that is not the exported volume as such compared to the others, but it's still, uh, still very interesting play. 
uh, how this is going to play out. The U.S. is now uh, dredging ports in the U.S. Gulf, getting ready for for VLCC and Suez Max uh, export cargoes. I think we're seeing about a million barrels of oil exporting per day now out of the States. That's one Suez Max a day. Um, and this, of course, increases tonnes, and this can only be very positive for the industry. But once the OPEC uh, discussion comes back into play, uh, one would envisage that uh, the, the Arabian Gulf players would not want to see the U.S. taking more and more uh, market share, and uh, they would have to show, try to claw something back. And it's a very intricate game, which will be very interesting to see how it plays out. Okay. Thank you for that, Brian. I guess we have less than five minutes to go. We can open the, the floor up to questions. Anybody to volunteer for a question? We've, we've heard so much, we've learned everything, yeah? <laughs> I'd like to mention something. Um, basically, first of all, I'd like to call upon the, uh, the next speaker, Mr. Casper Ryder. Is he around? Casper? Okay, that's great. And one final comment on, on our panel, because earlier we just touched upon the idea of the scrubbers and the and the self reduction, which is a quite a revolutionary <coughs> topic, which in my mind is probably the main topic of the day. So we're going to hear a lot about that on the next session. In the meantime, I'd like to present the uh, speaker to come to the floor. Can you come to the floor?